everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Welcome back to the second part of episode number 160. How cereal became the number one breakfast food in the U.S. I normally say that I'm excited to talk about the different cultural aspects in the second part of expression episodes, but this one really hits home. Cereal arouses a sense of nostalgia in a lot of the Americans that I know. It brings about memories of childhood, simpler times, family breakfast. It's a wonderful topic of conversation that you can have with native speakers. Ask them, what was your favorite cereal when you were a child? And then maybe you can share something that you learned in today's lesson. Now, this is a short story with a lot of useful vocabulary. Take notes if you need, or be sure to sign up to premium content. You'll find the link for that in the episode notes. start with a bit of vocabulary. The word cereal has its roots in Latin. It comes from the word cerealis, which is derived from Ceres, the name of the ancient Roman goddess of agriculture and grain crops. Now, when the word cereal entered the English language in the 1800s, it was used to talk about any type of edible grain, from rice to barley, oats, and more. Today, cereal is widely used to refer to a variety of breakfast foods that are made from processed grains. We talk about cold cereal, like cornflakes and granola, to hot cereals, like oatmeal, cream of wheat, and grits. Hot cereals can also be called porridges, which gives the impression that it's hot mushy, creamy maybe. Although, to be honest, I rarely hear people say hot cereal or porridge. Most native speakers call each hot cereal by its name. Oatmeal is a porridge made of oats. Grits is a porridge made of ground corn. And cream of wheat is a porridge made of ground wheat kernels. It's actually the name of the brand, but we just use it to talk about the general food. So oatmeal, grits, and cream of wheat. Now, of course, each of those is prepared with hot water or milk. And as I mentioned before, they're porridges, so they're creamy or mushy in consistency when they're ready to eat. So creamy sounds great. Mushy can have a bit of a negative connotation. So you should know those terms, because if you talk about cereal in the U.S., most people will first think of the boxed stuff that you serve cold with milk. That's the stuff we're going to talk about today, the cold, ready-to-go stuff. Fresh cereal, it's normally described as crunchy or crispy, and if it's sat in milk for too long, do you know how we'd describe it? We'd say it's soggy. Hurry up, come to the table. Your cereal is getting soggy. Soggy. Usually bread products with too much moisture are soggy. Let me ask you, what comes to mind when you think of American breakfast? I've taught over 3,000 English classes and Many of my former students would mention pancakes and eggs with bacon, toast, waffles. Yeah, they were right. We do have those things. You also need to try a bagel when you're in New York, a breakfast burrito in the Southwest, biscuits and grits in the South. But did you know that the average American eats more cereal than any of those things? Breakfast cereal is a staple in the United States. 
According to the U.S. Census, as a country, we go through 2.7 billion boxes of cereal each year. Around 70% of U.S. households in the U.S. eat it, according to the U.S. Census of 2023. Having grown up in the U.S., I'm not surprised that over half of Americans eat cereal at least once a week, or that over 30% eat it more than three times a week. My family fits into that statistic. But the U.S. didn't always eat cereal. When early colonists settled in what is now the United States, way back in the 16 and 1700s, it wasn't uncommon to eat leftovers for breakfast. Leftovers refers to food from a previous meal. Colonists would eat leftovers for breakfast with bread or perhaps cornmeal mush, something like grits. Oftentimes, these meals were savory, right? Savory refers to foods that are either spicy or salty, but not sweet. The colonists ate savory breakfasts. Now, in the 1800s, Cornmeal remained popular. Even pancakes back then were made of corn flour or wheat flour, and they were not as fluffy as what you'd find today. The thing is, one's breakfast was largely dependent on what was available, and what was available depended on the region and how much money a family had. Those who lived near dairy farms would have milk and cheese, and butter to smear on their homemade bread. That was pretty fancy, though. Not a reality for everyone. The majority had porridge, eggs, homemade bread, and salted meat, like pork and bacon. Salted meat was a way to preserve meat before refrigerators were invented. Many rural communities preserved meat that way. Meat in the morning was viewed as desirable. It was a hearty breakfast. According to SeriousEats.com, cookbooks from the early 1900s show that Midwestern American families aspired to eating beefsteak, oysters, and even lamb first thing in the morning. That was until granula. G-R-A-N-U-L-A. The year was 1863. It was the predecessor of granola. You know granola, right? So modern granola is a popular breakfast food and snack at times made of rolled oats, nuts, seeds, and sweeteners such as honey or maple syrup. It's usually crunchy in texture because it's been baked. Early granola which was called granula, was created by Dr. James Caleb Jackson, a health advocate who had founded a prominent health and wellness retreat in a city called Dansville, up in New York. His guests would come in with hopes of revitalizing themselves through hydrotherapy, exercise, and by eating a purely vegetarian diet. Jackson was a promoter of vegetarianism, and granola was his healthy alternative to meat-heavy breakfasts. And granola was just a few ingredients, mostly graham flour and water. After baking them, the result was hard and grainy. The name granola came from the fact that the small baked particles looked like granules. Get it? Granules, granola. The problem was, it was tough to eat. You had to soak it before eating. You had to let it sit in liquid. You had to soak it before chewing. There was most definitely room for improvement. That's when Dr. Kellogg came into the picture. Does that name ring a bell? Kellogg? Kellogg's Frosted Flakes, perhaps? All right, we'll get there. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg was similar to Dr. Jackson in many ways. Obviously, they were both doctors. They both worked in 
health facilities. Dr. John Harvey worked at the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan, and his institution was hopping. It was the place to be for anyone who wanted to improve their health, right? And this was back in the late 1800s. Since Kellogg was a strong believer that nutrition greatly impacted our well-being and that meat was not a good breakfast food, he took it upon himself to improve granola by mixing oats, wheat, and corn together and baking it until it became pleasantly crispy. Some sources say he called his version granola with an O to avoid legal issues. Kellogg enjoyed experimenting in the kitchen, and he invited his brother Will Keith Kellogg to join him. Together, they invented cornflakes, an instant success among Kellogg's patients. He sold them on the fact that it was both nutritious and easily digestible. In American English, there's a common proverb, which is, you are what you eat. In other words, you physically are a product of what you put into your body. You are what you eat. Kellogg believed it, and so did one of his patients, C.W. Post. He thought cornflakes were so delicious and so healthy that he tried his luck in cereal making too and came up with what he called grape nuts. Over 125 years later, you can still find cornflakes and grape nuts at a U.S. supermarket. So how did cereal brands take their local success and make it national? After cornflakes became a hit at Kellogg's health facility, Kellogg decided to expand his business. At first, Kellogg's toasted cornflakes were sold in simple, brown paper bags. They were marketed as a health food with a label that listed its various health benefits, such as high in fiber and suitable for people with digestive disorders. The flakes were sold by the pound, and Kellogg's strong reputation as a health promoter spread. Now, meanwhile, the U.S. was changing. The Industrial Revolution brought about factories, a working class, and capitalism. New machines were able to drastically increase output, which affected cereal production as well. Cereal no longer needed to be packaged by hands. It could be mass-produced, and as a result, could be mass-marketed. It's one thing to get your product to land in a U.S. supermarket, another to convince society it's a good thing to buy. How did these cereal companies convince consumers to try cereal? Post hosted recipe competitions with cash prizes for anyone, mostly housewives, who could incorporate grape nuts into regular recipes. They put it into puddings, cheese casseroles, and even meatloaf. Kellogg, of course, handed out a bunch of free samples in the beginning to his patients, but Giving out free samples only goes so far. It was time to advertise. Now, unlike British people who say advertisements, Americans say advertisements, or ads for short. In the early 1900s, ads took the form of posters, billboards, or they could be found in print material, like magazines and newspapers. Ads were directed at adults in the beginning, mainly housewives who were tasked with the responsibility of feeding their families. Early ads not only focused on health, affordability, and taste, but on the notion that a bowl of cereal would be a well-rounded meal. Cereal was advertised as being the all-in-one solution to meal planning. Some families literally ate it up. Now, when one business succeeds, competition follows. 
Other companies seeing the success of Kellogg's and Post emerged into the cereal scene also, including Quaker Oats and General Mills. They, alongside Kellogg's and Post, are some of the most popular brands you'll see today. Quaker Oats, apart from oatmeal, had discovered that rice puffs up when exposed to high-pressured steam. In 1904, they brought puffed rice to the world by shooting it from cannons at the World Fair. Its slogan became, the cereal shot from guns. General Mills' first cereal was Wheaties, the breakfast of champions. The early success of cereal was largely thanks to marketing strategy. Let's take a closer look at Post's grape nuts. It's somewhat misleading, isn't it? It contains neither grapes nor nuts. The list of ingredients is surprisingly short. Whole grain wheat flour, malted barley flour, salt, and dried yeast. And yet, one of their advertisements from 1903 said that you could get more nourishment from one pound of grape nuts than from 10 pounds of meat, wheat, oats, or bread. Grape nuts were said to cure an alcohol addiction, improve your brain function, they could make you a better man, a better housewife. Nobody even knew what a grape nut was, but the marketing was convincing enough. People bought it. And as I mentioned before, it's still at the supermarket today. I even had it for breakfast. Now, many uh, adults bought into the idea that cereal was healthy. It was good for them. That alone was reason enough to buy it. But what about kids? Kellogg realized the importance of marketing to families because kids eat too. And kids would pressure their parents to buy what they love. So how can you get kids to love cereal? After many disputes between the Kellogg brothers, Corn Flakes added more sugar right at the beginning of their career. Then in 1909, Corn Flakes came out with their first in-box prize. You may be familiar with this tactic. McDonald's used the same tactic with their world-famous kids' Happy Meals. Then came colorful packaging with slogans and mascots. A slogan is a short, catchy phrase used to market a product. For example, Nike, just do it. McDonald's, I'm loving it. And Apple, Apple products, think different. Now, cereal companies created slogans too. Here are some of the most famous. Lucky Charms, they're magically delicious. Frosted Flakes, they're great. Tricks. Silly Rabbit, tricks are for kids. Cereal brands didn't only get slogans and fun, colorful packaging, they also got mascots. A mascot is a character that is used to represent a company, a team, or an institution. For example, on the Chicago Bulls NBA team, you'll see Benny the Bull running across the court. Benny is a mascot. He keeps the energy high, gets fans cheering when they need to, and booing when the other team is throwing a free throw. Cereal brands also got mascots. One of the earliest and most iconic is Tony the Tiger from Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. He was introduced to the world back in 1952. The tactic worked. Other cereals jumped on the bandwagon. They also got mascots. Kids loved them. And good thing, too, because at the time there was a huge increase in the number of kids. After World War II, many American families had babies. We call that general time frame the baby boom. And all the people born during it, the baby boomers. Now, simultaneously, as all of these babies are being born, many U.S. homes got TVs. So there's more kids and more TVs. It wasn't rocket science. 
cereal brands took advantage of all the eyes and advertised through commercials. These commercials were colorful and fun. They had jingles, little songs, little tunes that people could remember, slogans, and the images with their mascots. That, alongside the sweet cereal they advertised, was so appealing that kids started begging for it. And, to be honest, the timing couldn't have been better. More than ever, women were headed to the workforce, and they needed a more convenient, quick breakfast option. Cereal seemed like the solution to a chaotic morning. Talk about pressure. Pressure was coming from all angles. Even the milk industry. During the 20th century, milk was advertised by the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, and dairy farmers as essential in one's diet, especially in a child's. They needed the calcium for bone development. There were programs at schools, dietary guidelines, all that included milk. All right, so parents had all of this pressure, pressure from government institutions, right, promoting milk. You had the pressure from the cereal companies who were saying, yes, this is a well-rounded breakfast. It's convenient. It's healthy. It tastes good. And your kids, at the end of the day, are begging for it. So what happened? People ate cereal. For a while, very sweet, sugary cereal reigned. More and more boxes, more and more options appeared on the shelves, from Lucky Charms with marshmallows to Frosted Flakes, Cocoa Puffs, Fruity Pebbles. I could go on forever. Of course, as time passes, cereal adapts. If it didn't, right, it wouldn't survive. So many companies now fortify cereals with extra iron, vitamin D, folic acid, calcium, a bunch of different things to make them more interesting to consumers. Nowadays, you'll also see so many different gluten-free and keto-friendly options. All right, so companies are adapting. They're also offering different types of breakfast foods. For example, cereal bars, Pop-Tarts, Eggos. Those are some of Kellogg's special breakfasts. For many people who grow up in the United States, certain cereals bring about a sense of nostalgia. Lots of my friends have memories of going to the grocery store with their parents and begging them to get their favorite cereals. I'm now a parent, and I experience the same thing with my daughters. Now, I don't blame them when they get excited seeing Captain Crunch or the colorful marshmallows dancing across a box of Lucky Charms. I do too. And I don't always buy them, but every now and then they find their way into the cart. And when they do, I see my daughter's eyes light up. It's nuts how much excitement can come from a box of cereal. Now, sometimes I wonder if the next generation will know the slogans like we do today, given that they don't watch as many commercials. But I don't think cereal is going anywhere soon. As I said, in American English, we say we are what we eat. And cereal is ingrained in us. To wrap up today's lesson, I'd like to share five fun facts about cereal. Number one. Can you guess the number one cereal in the United States? In terms of sales, Cheerios takes the top spot, with both the highest revenue and most boxes sold annually. Cheerios alone makes over $430 million per year. Number two, if you have purchased cereal in the U.S., you may have seen box tops for education on the top of the box. Participating cereals and other products in the United States who have that box top label donate 10 cents for every box top you get to schools of your choice. Now, it can be 
your child's school or a school in need. All you need to do is scan your receipt to the Box Tops for Education app. Number three, in addition to cereal's cultural significance, I mean, it even has its own holiday, March 7th, breakfast cereal has had a profound impact on our economy and agriculture. The demand for cereal grains led to the expansion of agricultural production in the United States, particularly in regions like the Midwest, which is known as the Corn Belt. Number four, cereal cafes have popped up all around New York City. One of the most famous cereal bars I know of is the Momofuku Milk Bar, which was created by the crazy famous pastry chef, Christina Rossi. She incorporates cereal into several of her desserts, including cookies with cornflakes and cereal milk soft serve ice cream. Yeah, you know that good milk at the bottom of your cereal bowl? Imagine that as a creamy ice cream. Her shop is definitely worth visiting if you are in New York City. Momofuku Milk Bar. Number five, which is sort of like the last one. Yeah, cereal is not just consumed as is or in a bowl with milk. It's used in many recipes. Rice Krispie treats, for example, are made of Rice Krispies cereal or puffed rice with butter and marshmallow. Absolutely delicious. Corn flakes are often used on the top of casseroles to make a crispy outer layer or even a crispy coating for fried or baked chicken. Grape nuts, I mentioned previously. I think a lot of you are going to try it and think that it tastes like it's 125 years old. Um, but yeah, it's been around for a long time and it's actually used in ice cream in Maine. So one of the popular ice cream flavors there is grape nut ice cream. So you can try that also. Last but not least, my favorite muffins use Kellogg's Raisin Bran as a base. And it's probably the recipe I've made the most in my entire lifetime. So I'll post that recipe for you guys. Just check the episode notes. That's it for today's episode. We talked about a lot. We talked about the rise of breakfast cereal in the United States, from its origins as a health food remedy to its status as a beloved breakfast option. Cereal has undergone a remarkable transformation over the past century. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.